Um, one second, I just got to get set up. Oh, it's been a while since I've been up here, so it feels a bit weird, but it's okay. Um, hi everyone, my name is Jerusha, like Jerusalem, but Jerusha. Um, and I am leading 1830 at the moment, and Sean and Esther have given you a bit of an introduction as to what 1830 is all about. And I guess it was really cool that we're happening one week after camp, so you guys get to see a bit of what we do at camp um, and the faces of 1830. Most of them sit on that side, but I think we are kind of scattered across. Um, so just to tell you a bit about myself, I have been working in church for about five years now, um, and I'm pregnant. I'm not just <laughs> very <laughs> overweight. Um, for those of you who are wondering, I've been wondering for the past like <laughs> six months. Um, I've had a lot of aunties come up to me and ask me very politely, which is nice. Um, but I'm a, yeah, John and I are expecting a kid, a baby girl, I think. <laughs> we'll see. We'll, we'll see on the day. Um, but she is expected in about three months. Maybe earlier, we'll see. Um, but yes, please be praying for us. <laughs> this is our first one, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, I am still kind of in 1830, because today my message is actually addressing the young adults, um, and I'm still actually considered to be in the millennial generation, because it goes all the way up to 1981, <laughs> apparently. Um, but today, I guess, um, the whole generation series, it's about identifying what in each generation, does that generation kind of value a lot? And then to address that in that context. Um, so one of the things I've kind of thought about, and as I talked to a lot of young adults, um, one of the things that I identified um, is people pleasing um, as a bit of a, a thing that we all face. Um, and I'll explain a bit about why that has come up. Um, but yes, but before we do that, let's pray and dedicate this time to God. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God, for your word that brings life, your word that sets the captives free, God. Um, and Father, as we go into your word, we pray that you open our hearts to hear from you directly, God. Um, remove every distraction, and I pray that um, you help us, Lord, to just hear your voice today, God. And I pray that your word will change our lives and um, help us to love you and to love others better as well. And so we commit this time to you. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Cool. So as I said, I'm past 30 now, just a bit, um, but I'm still in the millennial generation. Um, so why has people-pleasing become a little bit of a problem, particularly our generation, even though I think all generations actually do face this issue? Um, when I was in uni, we started having phones. The iPhone actually, I think, was invented in when I was in my first year of uni, I think. Um, and then there was Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, all these social networks started coming up. Um, and so we were kind of like born into this, or oh, the formative years, um, where we engaged with our peers and things. We had these social networks where we not only share like very minute aspects of our lives, but we also invite people to review it. So they, they kind of like go on Instagram and then they tell us how much they like our <laughs> experiences. Um, and I was reflecting on this, and I was thinking about my parents and what they would have shared with their peers in those times, actually even when I was in primary school. You would go to a holiday and you would experience things on the holiday, and you would take pictures of things that were significant on that holiday, like highlights. You know, like if you go to a really cool place, you see Eiffel Tower or something, and you take a picture there. Um, but now, we <laughs> go into the hotel room, we take a picture of our <laughs> like bathroom, our toilet, our um, view, um, our bed, and show you every single thing um, that we experience in, in these experiences that we have. Uh, and so it's almost like a bit of an oversharing. To, be, to that being said, I actually really enjoy looking at people's minute highlights. I like looking at their scrambled eggs and their bacon. Um, so I, my point is that, that that in itself is not a bad thing, but I'll, I'll keep going. But yeah, the times have changed. And I think our generation is, has grown up in a place where we are just sharing a lot. And we're very, very, very social. Um, we don't consume food, drinks, services, or products or media silently. We're very loud <laughs> when, we, when we share it. Because it's almost like if we don't share it, 
it didn't quite happen. Um, and even leading up to camp, I tried to fast Instagram. Well, I fasted Instagram, but it's not real fasting. Um, and I would actually like swipe to the spot where I usually have Instagram and like put my thumb there when the icon wasn't even there. And so it goes to show you <laughs> that we're so used to just checking Instagram like all the time. Um, and then like I would eat something, I'd be like, oh, I should share this. And I'm like, oh wait, I'm fasting. Um, so it's a real thing that I even struggled with. And research actually shows that we are probably one of the most sociable generations. You know, the millennials and Gen Zs. Um, we're more likely to shop, eat, travel with peers. And also the marketing research shows that um, we, when we shop, we usually only make decisions after we've checked with people um, and sought their opinion first. And if they agree that it's awesome, then we feel like it's awesome. Um, and we don't make major decisions um, before we check with other people as well. So social media has really shaped us, I think, as a generation. Um, and I think Spider-Man, <laughs> thanks for the Spider-Men that were playing before. Um, and sorry you got chucked at, like balls were chucked at you, sorry. Um, but I think it's a really good superhero to represent this generation. Um, I remember the first Toby, not the first one, but Toby Maguire's movie in 2002 <laughs> came out. I was 12. Um, and I remember watching that and going, oh my goodness, finally, a happy superhero. You know, not like Batman, who's always like super serious. Spider-Man was actually quite fun. He was really carefree at the start. But I think he is a good um, superhero to represent our generation because ultimately if you keep watching the other um, sequels he actually became one of the saddest superheroes because he couldn't say no to people he couldn't actually bear to disappoint the public um, and in the end he gave up his his freedom he gave up his relationship with MJ poor girl um, and yeah she, he actually became one of the saddest even though he was actually one of the most carefree um, and so, unfortunately, even though he was the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, he was one of the most social superheroes. He also was a people pleaser. Um, and in the end, he became one of the most tragic superheroes in the end. Um, and so, I think that's something that we can all kind of relate to, to some extent, especially the millennials and the Gen Zs. So, people pleasing is not so amazing. And that's the title of my message today. Um, the tricky thing is that people pleasing is sometimes a bit hard to spot um, because in society that we're with, that we're in, especially this culture, um, is something that is so ingrained within our culture, um, and sometimes it can be hard to know if you're even someone that's caught up with people pleasing, someone that's caught up in wanting to please people more than wanting to please God. Um, 1830, uh, we have actually a, a key verse that people often forget. But I'll remind you guys one more time, especially the young adults. Um, it's Romans 12, 2. And it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect, and pleasing to Him. See, the problem with people pleasing, sorry, I'm not using my slides, I'm forgetting. <laughs> um, the, problem with, the problem with people pleasing um, is that it's actually it's a normal thing that most of us have conformed to. It's a pattern that most of us are, have actually like, allowed to define what we do. Um, and it's something that we often even encourage and we use as a gauge to see if people are doing well. So for example, if... So, if to assess if someone's actually doing well, we kind of go, are they someone that can um, get along really well with most people? Are they someone that is a good, like, social person who um, can connect with people very well? Um, do people like them? If people like them, then they're likely to be doing well in life. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we should be people that push people away and are very un like, make people feel unsafe and uncomfortable. But I think it becomes a problem when what people think of you um, becomes core to your identity. Um, it gets unhealthy when you wanting people to like you becomes core to your identity. 
to the point where, as a Christian, what they think matters more than what God thinks of you. And then to the point where you equate how much or how many people like you to your worth or your value, or even to the worth and value of other people. So today, I hope that the Holy Spirit will invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us about this area. Um, as we said in Romans 12 too, that he will allow us to um, transform and renew our minds so that we actually don't use people pleasing as a gauge, but we actually use how much we live to please God as our gauge in life, um, so that we can actually discern what his will is for our lives. Um, so let's dig into the Bible, but um, let's look at some people who were actually caught up in people pleasing in the Bible. Initially, when I was thinking about it, I was like, oh, no one's, no one in the Bible is people pleasing. But then when I was just doing a bit more research and reflection, there's actually quite a lot of people pleasers in the Bible. Um, and let's look at some of their traits, their motivations, and what their behaviors look like. Okay, the first one is Aaron. Um, I'm not sure if you guys know much about him. I'll give a little bit of context before we go into Exodus 32. Um, but he was actually second in command to Moses, who was the leader that God appointed to lead the Israelites out of slavery from Egypt. So in Exodus 20 to 24, just to set a bit of a context, like God had rescued the Israelites from Egypt and he saved them from slavery. He brought them through, you know, the Red Sea, parted the Red Sea, showed them a lot of miracles. And then he actually revealed himself to them on Mount Sinai. So he, he actually like descended on Mount Sinai and they could see his glory. And they were so scared of him because they were like trembling. Um, and it says it, his, his presence and his power is made evident to the Israelites. And in those moments, God actually gave them the Ten Commandments as well. So that was the first time they heard the Ten Commandments and it was written down on a tablet. And one of those commandments was, do not worship other gods. Do not create for yourself a carved image and worship it, right? 40 days later, which is where we come to in Exodus 32, after experiencing all of that, they did exactly what God had told them not to do. So while Moses, who was the first in charge, went up to Mount Sinai again to meet with God, he was actually away for 40 days. And while waiting for 40 days, they lost patience and then asked Aaron, basically, to make them a god to worship. And so let's start by reading that. So when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together um, to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us, as for this Moses, this man, um, who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, fashioned it with a graving tool, and made a golden calf. So he actually made this golden calf for them, which is a baby cow. And then he said, and then they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and then he made a proclamation saying, tomorrow shall be the feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So Aaron, as the second in charge, who was actually the leader at that time because Moses wasn't around, he actually succumbed to the pressure from the people to make a god for them to worship. Why did he do that? Um, it's likely that he was maybe afraid of them, that they would actually maybe hurt him, maybe they would grumble against him, maybe um, he was scared of like, no, not being liked by them. But he didn't only just do what they asked him to do. They, he didn't actually just make this God for them to worship. He actually took them to the next level. 
he actually create organized worship of this golden calf, not only make this golden calf. So he saw them kind of declare that, that God as God, and then he said, okay, I'll, I'll take you guys further. <laughs> I will like make an altar, and then you guys can worship it even more the next day. So he enabled them, and then he led them even further away from God's commands. If you guys know this story well, what happened after that? So the outcome of his, his leadership, being a people pleaser, um, when Moses came down from the mountain, Moses was like, what's going on? How, how could you have let the people do this? And then Aaron actually said, yeah, I got all the jewelry from them, but then I like tossed it into the fire and then like popped out this golden calf. So he actually shirked responsibility. He, didn't, he actually lied to Moses and didn't take responsibility for his actions. Um, on top of that, God actually punished the Israelites, and then a lot of the Israelites actually died that day as a result of their disobedience. And then on top of that, God was so angry that he actually said to Moses, I actually don't want to be with these people anymore. So beforehand, God, they had the protection of God, the presence of God with them, and God's like, nah, I don't really want to continue. And so they almost lost their identity as God's people as well. But thank God, Moses uh, interceded for them and then God didn't leave them. And so I think for us, we look at this story and we go, we're not like Aaron, you know, we're quick to judge him and go, if we saw the Red Sea part, if we saw God's presence on that mountain, we would not have said yes to these people. We would have stood up and gone, you guys need to recognize the God that you're worshiping and actually worship God instead of trying to worship another God. But actually, I think that we are more like him in many ways than we think. So in our society, if the majority think it's okay to do something, it's likely that we define that thing as reasonable or even socially good. It's some, if it's something that most of us um, are comfortable with and we agree on, then we think it's reasonable or socially good. Sometimes we use others as a gauge for what we should do instead of using God as the gauge. And so, as I said before, people pleasing can sometimes be disguised, and it can be disguised as being reasonable or even good, depending on the majority around us. So, the other thing, the other group of people we want to think about were the religious Jews that existed during the time of Jesus. Um, and the passage we're going to focus on is John 5. But again, I'll give you a bit of context. So what happened in this passage was um, Jesus was doing his ministry and he decided, he saw a man that was lame, so he couldn't walk for 38 years. Um, and that was a long time for someone not to be able to walk. Um, and he saw this man and he decided to heal him. Right? And he told the man to get up, take his bed up and walk, which was an amazing thing because this man couldn't walk for like super long but Jesus decided to do it on the Sabbath and for those of you who know what the Sabbath means um, it's something that God instated to help remind the Israelites that they were to rest to rest from work and to create a reliance on him and to spend that day to meditate on him but the Jews took it to the next level they saw this man take the, the bed out and walk and their first question to him um, was whether he was, the issue they had with him was, I mean, they, they didn't, instead of going, oh my goodness, you're walking after 38 years, they said, um, who, who told you to do that? Because you're breaking the Sabbath law by working, by taking up your bed and walking. And so instead of being amazed at the miracle that Jesus did, their first question was whether it was lawful for this man to pick up the bed, his bed. So let's go into the passage a bit more. Um, so Jesus saw this and he decided to confront them. He said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. 
I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you've set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So basically, Jesus called them out because they thought that following the law was where they found eternal life. They believed that the more closely they followed religious law, the more holy and righteous they were, and the more glory they actually received from one another because they thought it showed who was the greatest, who was the best, who was the most holy and pure. But Jesus was saying that that was not the case. And we think we're not like the religious Jews. You know, we look at them and we go, if we saw a man who couldn't walk for 38 years and he got up and he started walking, our first response would be, um, oh my goodness, like who asked, who, who, um, who asked you to walk? Because that man is amazing, right? But I think in the same way, we are often more concerned about receiving glory, esteem, and honor from one another instead of being concerned with what Jesus is actually doing around us and giving glory, esteem, and honor to him. So in the same way, we can actually be like the religious Jews and miss what Jesus is doing because of the people around us or the, our, our being more concerned with our own status. So the point I was making before was that people pleasing can sometimes be disguised. So the first point was that it can be disguised as something reasonable or good, depending on the majority. But the second thing can be disguised as is being religious. So instead of Jesus himself being the goal, our perception of what, what the, the way we want people to perceive us as being holy and righteous can sometimes be our goal instead. So we do all these things as a Christian to improve people's perception of us. Um, the idea of how good and holy we are, or how nice we are. Um, again, people's perception of us being the goal, more so than to please God as the goal. And when we do this, we actually fail to see what God might be doing around us, how might he actually might be wanting to use us, what he might be leading us into, um, because we're so caught up in our own plan and agenda. So those are the two examples that I had from the Bible. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, because it's so hard to actually distinguish whether you're someone who is a people pleaser or a God pleaser. Um, so I'll give you a bit of an analogy, and then I'll talk about some markers that you can identify in your own life to help you figure it out and allow the Holy Spirit to speak into that. Uh, so about eight, wait, 10 years ago, I was in New Zealand with my brother, with my sister-in-law now, Joe and a friend called Wendy. And we actually went on a hike in New Zealand, but uh, it wasn't, it, even though it was winter, it wasn't actually snowing everywhere. It was only snowing on the mountains. And so we were wearing jeans, we were wearing our chucks, so our like Converse shoes, and we were wearing like maybe one snow jacket, but we're definitely not ready for snowy kind of weather. We went to like the foot of the mountain, and then we went to the info desk, and we were like, oh, can we go for a hike? Can you show us what would be appropriate hike to do? And then, the guy like stared us down and was like, you are not prepared <laughs> for going on a hike in the mountains, for sure not. Um, and he didn't really go into detail as to why, um, but he basically said, oh, just go for this like 20 minute walk around this area and you'll be fine. And so we, did, we tried to do that. So we got the map and then we started walking. But because we didn't follow the right markers, we ended up going on this three hour, this is a photo I took in that hike. Uh, we went up, ended up going for a three hour hike um, unintentionally because we followed the wrong markers. It was cold, it was freezing, we were like caught in a blizzard. You can't really see that clearly in this photo, but there was like snow pelting on our faces. We were all wet because we were wearing jeans, which was really dumb. Um, and so, Sometimes people pleasing can a bit, be a bit like that. We think we're following God's markers, but actually it's a lot more like, 
we're not getting burnt out, we're getting, getting like wet, tired, and we're like, why is this going for so long? Because we're actually following our own markers or people-pleasing markers instead of God's markers. Um, so it's almost like being spiritually blind um, in the same way. So what are some people-pleasing markers? So one of the markers is that um, you might be someone, if you're a people pleaser, you're likely to be someone who is easily swayed um, and threatened. So for Aaron, for example, he was a leader that was very easily swayed by the people. Instead of leading people closer to God, he led them further away. Um, and so if people pleasing is core to your identity, you tend to make decisions um, and tend to define your worth based on what people think. You know, what's the most popular opinion? You, go, you kind of go along with that. You go along with what's most acceptable, reasonable, comfortable, according to the majority around you, which changes with the season. So you're constantly swayed by whatever the majority thinks at that point in time. Threatened, the Pharisees, uh, or a group of really religious Jews that were highly esteemed in society at that time. When, when Jesus was rising in popularity because of his authority, because he was healing people, they looked at Jesus and they, didn't, they failed to see what Jesus was doing and saw him as a threat and tried to get rid of him because he was threatening their reputation. And so sometimes when people like others better than they like you or they're doing better than you, you actually feel kind of threatened by those people um, because you suddenly feel like you are worth less because people don't like you as much. Um, and they, you think that you're worth less than that person that people might be gravitating to. So one marker to reflect on is, are you someone who is easily swayed and easily threatened? The second marker is um, inconsistent behavior across contexts. So Aaron again, he, he behaved one way and then when Moses questioned him, he lied to Moses. So his, his words were not consistent. It was depending on who he was trying to please at the time. And even Peter, who was one of Jesus' closest disciples, um, he was actually, if you read Galatians 2, he was someone that was reaching out to non-Jewish people, um, the Gentiles, and he was eating with them, sharing the gospel with them. But the minute he heard, he saw the religious Jews come, he actually distanced himself from the Gentiles and actually sat only with the religious Jews and ate with them. It's almost like the Gentiles didn't exist. And so he was really, um, he was acting out of fear in those moments and afraid of what people would think and that that drove his actions. So he was inconsistent um, across different contexts. Another marker we can look at is whether you are directed by your own self-interest and if you tend to point people to yourself um, the religious Jews and Pharisees were often seeking glory for themselves. So as we said before, they didn't, when the man was healed, they were concerned more about, not, not how, like, the, that the man was healed. They weren't concerned about the welfare of people. Their main concern was their status in society and how they were perceived and the ability to police other people to make sure they also kept the standard. So are your daily decisions and your interactions um, directed by your own self-interest and your own desire to be glorified by others? When you interact with other people, do you want them to look up, up to you? Or do you want them to look at you and see Jesus and see Christ through you? Are your actions directed for your love for people or for yourself? So that's a really important question that we need to ask. The fourth one is that you're often motivated by fear if you're a people pleaser. So Aaron, the Peter, Peter, the religious leaders, they often made decisions out of fear, for other, fear of others, not reverence for God, um, and not the desire to please God or to show his love to people. And we often see this fear play out in two ways. It can play in other ways as well. Um, but often um, being afraid to say no to others in the fear of disappointing them or them having a negative perception of you. And so you say yes to everything that they ask of you all the time. Or the flip side is that you're so afraid of failure or disappointment that you don't step into the things or don't say yes to the things that God might be actually inviting you into. 
So those are the two ways that often we see it play out. And both can feel very crippling and stifling because fear actually hinders you from journeying with God and walking in His Spirit. And it says in 2 Timothy 1, um, His Spirit is not one of fear, but one of power, love, and self-control. And so when you don't do that, it actually stops you from walking in along with His Spirit. And it, it, just, it just doesn't feel like you're free. It feels very stifling and, and like you're trapped and stuck. So those are the people-pleasing markers. Um, I want to flip it around now and talk about what does it look like then to be someone who actually pleases God rather than please people. So the first one is instead of being easily swayed and threatened, you are actually someone who tends to be more stable and resilient. Um, even though Peter had his flaws, him and Paul, the apostle, and other apostles, despite their flaws, they actually endured severe persecution um, from the Roman Empire. They set up churches because they were starting many, many churches, and those churches didn't always love them. You know, the churches actually like disappointed them, questioned them, um, were sometimes really annoying. <laughs> um, but they didn't stop doing what they were called to do. Even when they faced physical and emotional suffering, they continued with what they were doing because they were faithful to what they believed God had called them to do. So they showed a stability and a resilience that only came from this commitment they had to God, not to please people. So pleasing God as the goal allows us to be more stable, certain, and unwavering in our decisions and our commitment to God. Um, since God himself is constant and he doesn't change and chop like people do. The second marker is, if you're, a God, if you're someone who's more concerned about pleasing God, you tend to have behavior that's aligned with the gospel across all contexts. Depend, like, it doesn't matter who you're with, you, you are consistent because God is your point of reference, not people. Um, so Paul, so when Peter was acting inconsistently and not sitting with the Gentiles, but sitting with the religious Jews and eating with them, Paul actually publicly called Peter out and told him off. He said in Galatians 2.14, uh, when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So Paul knew that it was important for them as leaders to demonstrate this behavior that was consistent with the love of the gospel um, and the freedom that came with it. So sometimes being someone who is concerned with pleasing God means that you actually have to step into confrontations like this, which can be sometimes be a bit uncomfortable for a lot of us, um, but sometimes that's actually what God calls us to do, rather than backing away from some of these confrontations. The last marker is instead of being motivated by, um, wait one second, did I just skip one? Yes, I just skip one, sorry. Um, so instead of being directed by your own self-interest and points, pointing people to yourself, you're someone that actually is directed by God and His Spirit. And you tend to point people towards God. So it, back to John 5, um, the passage that we were studying earlier, Jesus actually is our prime example of someone who didn't allow what people thought of him to define what he did. Um, he simply, it says in verse 19, he just did what he saw the Father do. And that was his point of reference. Um, in John 5, when he chose to heal that man, he knew that it was the Sabbath. He knew that it would upset the religious Jews. Um, but his priority was this man's healing and restoration. Um, whenever he ate with tax collectors or people that the, the religious Jews defined as unclean or sinners, whenever he ate with those people, he wasn't thinking about what the religious people thought. He wasn't thinking about his own reputation, but he was thinking about how can he bring the love of God into those spaces. So Jesus' focus was not on his own self and self-preservation. He was thinking more about how can I um, reveal the Father to these people. So in the same way, do your thoughts and your actions 
prioritize what God wants of you and how you can show his character and his love to people around you? Um, or are you more concerned with what you stand to gain and how much glory you can get um, from those around you? The last marker I want to talk about is being, um, instead of being motivated by fear, you're actually someone who's motivated by reverence and love for God and your love for people. I don't know about you guys, but whenever I've been driven by fear, there's this like um, sense of striving that comes and a lack of rest. But when we're actually more concerned with pleasing God, there's a peace and a joy that often we experience from Him. Jesus said in um, John chapter 5, verse 39, um, to the religious Jews that it wasn't in the scriptures that they would find eternal life, but it was in him. I think sometimes we try to find um, life and meaning and purpose in the eyes of other people, but actually, if we went to Jesus directly, we would experience that instead. You know, um, when we are guided and led by him, that's actually what gives us true life and meaning. And when we do that, we actually don't have to strive as much because we can experience his love and we don't need that approval or that affirmation from other people. So when Christ is our guide, when the Holy Spirit is our guide, we can actually say no to the people that we need to say no to and then yes to the things that we might be afraid of but he's leading us into. Um, I just want to wrap up by talking a bit about my personal experience with people pleasing. <laughs> Um, initially, I was like, oh God, I'm not a people pleaser. And as I said, it can be very easily disguised. Um, but then like, God actually showed that to me. Um, so as a young adult, when I was before 25, um, I was someone who actually prided um, myself in being there for people. Because I think I'm quite an objective person. I like asking like, good questions. And so a lot of my friends actually often come to me to share their problems. Um, and I think I actually started to enjoy that and to, um, I liked being confided in, basically. Um, but I realized it became a little bit of a problem when my, one of my friends, my closest friends, was actually telling me that one of their family members was sick. Um, and my first thought, instead of going, oh, how can I pray for this person? Um, and like, how can I support this person? Was, was I the first person that they told? And have they told anyone else about this, or is it just me? Um, and I realized that that was a pattern that was emerging in my interactions with a lot of my friends. Uh, concern about whether I was the first one they confided in, or whether um, they were willing, how much they were willing to share with me. And then if I found out that they told other people first, or they told people like things that they didn't tell me, I felt threatened, and I got offended, and I would be like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you didn't tell me. Um, so it was very obvious that my worth was actually tied up in how much people trusted me with their confidential private information. Um, and so what they thought about me was more important than what they were actually sharing with me. Um, and then that stopped me from actually focusing on how I could show them God's love in those moments and how God might have actually been wanting to use me to bless them. But I think God convicted me over time. Don't judge me, please. Like, we're all still works in progress. Um, but yeah, God convicted me over time and showed me how self-centered I was, what a horrible friend I actually was. Sorry to my friends back then. Um, but I think over time, the Holy Spirit taught me to direct my attention away from myself towards those around me and towards God. And so I became more okay over time with people not telling me things that they may not have felt comfortable with or maybe telling people, other people that they might have related to better. Um, and now I feel like when people do share their issues with me, I can actually pay closer attention to what the Holy Spirit is doing in their lives and then how I can kind of partner with the Holy Spirit to encourage them or to bless them. Now that I'm a bit older, um, I think one thing I'm still struggling with is people pleasing in work. In, in, I know as a speech pathologist, in church, um, you often get feedback or like criticism in different ways. Um, and I liked being liked by people. So when people don't like me, my first response is thinking that there's a problem with them rather than me. 
Um, and so when someone gives me negative feedback, I tend to be like really defensive and emotional about it. Um, instead of trying to focus on how they might be trying to help me grow, um, I tend to focus on the reasons why their reasons are invalid. <laughs> Um, but I think God has, is teaching me to slowly accept criticism. Please don't like, all come at once. Um, to pray about the areas that actually might be true, you know, that, I, that God might actually want me to work on and to grow in and to kind of for, forget or shake off the things that are not helpful. Um, but I think going to God for my, to understand my worth in Him and understanding that I don't need love from affirmation from other people, but I can receive that from God allows me then to associate any criticism I get from people, um, not to associate the criticism with my worth. Um, and then I can process it in a more like objective, helpful kind of way. So that's my personal, a bit of a snapshot of my personal experience with people pleasing. Um, and so I want to finish with a challenge to, to you guys. Um, if you can dim the lights as well. How can, so Jesus ends, in his passage, he actually says, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? So my question to you to, to finish up is, who are you seeking to glorify in your life? Is it yourself or is it God? Is your search for other people's approval actually keeping you from stepping into the things that God might actually be wanting to call you into? Um, maybe because people may not understand, people may think it's foolish, um, you're, you're, you feel like you're on the line a little bit, um, or maybe it's not keeping in step with popular opinion, or you're afraid of failing or disappointing people, so you'd rather not just take that step. Is your search for other people's approval keeping you from saying no to the people, the things that you should be saying no to? Um, so you say to yes, yes to everything and it's kind of like burning you out and you feel so resentful because you're in a really bad place. Is your desire for others' approval causing you to feel discouraged, disappointed, underappreciated and so anxious that you can't continue with the things that God um, might be asking you to persevere in? Or you might feel like a bit of a racehorse, like a bit of how I was, where you have like those blinders and all you can see are your own interests um, and how others perceive you, that you actually can't see what God is doing around you um, and actually be a part of that. So if anything that I've said so far and, and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, I actually want to invite you to stand up um, because I want to pray for you. And I, I believe that God wants, um, wants to release us from that trap of having that pressure and that striving to please other people. Um, so as the worship team um, sings your way, um, I just want you guys to stand up or actually maybe just up the music a bit. Um, and I just want to pray for people who struggle with this. So can you yeah, just stand up if you feel like the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about this area in your life.
Father, for the people who have stood up today, God. Father, you see their struggle. You see, Lord, the fear that they have of people. You see their desire, God, to please you rather than to please others, God. And we know that's something that we can't orchestrate on our own, Lord, but it's by your Holy Spirit that you change our perspective. It's by your Holy Spirit that you change um, who is Lord of our lives, God. And so, Father, I pray for everyone who stood up, that you direct their attention to you, God, that you be their motivation for every decision in their lives, for every action in their lives, God. I pray that you break the chains off of them, Father. The chains of people pleasing Lord, and caring so much about what others think of them. Father, we pray that you release them, Lord, from those chains. And Father, you replace it with freedom so that they may run, so that they may run with you, God, and not grow weary. That Father, that they may speak your truth with boldness, with courage, to speak into the things, God, that you are asking them to speak into, to love those who they, they can't love at the moment, Lord, because they're so focused on themselves. We just ask, Lord, for a refreshing, a, re, a, a renewal, a restoration, Lord, so that they can be your hands and your feet to, to people around them, Lord, so that um, when they, they can love people freely, so that the people around them can encounter you, Lord, in a powerful, life-changing way, that they can encounter the move of your Holy Spirit, Lord. So I pray that you release us, whatever blockage it is, Lord, in these lives, I pray that you release us to help us be the conduits of your love, Lord. Take away the attention from ourselves and help us to, to look to you, Lord. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you forgive us for making it about us, for seeking glory in ourselves, Father. But help us to glorify you in all that we do, Father. And so we pray for freedom. We pray for restoration. And we, and we just ask for your Holy Spirit to show us, to teach us, to change us from the inside out, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we're just going to sing this song one more time. And I invite you guys, if you want further prayer for this to actually come up to the front and people will be here to pray for you um but yes thank you